Towards the end of 1999 and in early 2000, World Championship Wrestling simply couldn't afford to lose any of its true hard-working superstars. The WWF had made an incredible comeback in the Monday Night Wars, whereas WCW were trying to fix their television broadcasts by bringing in guys like Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara. Vince McMahon's company could simply do no wrong, while World Championship Wrestling seemingly couldn't do anything right. If you look at the WCW and WWF rosters towards the end of 1999 though, you could argue that World Championship Wrestling had a better list of superstars in terms of work rate guys. The company had given their superstars big contracts before and during the Nitro Glory days, and some superstars negotiated very attractive deals while WCW was firing on all cylinders and that includes superstars that were considered mid-carders. So a lot of these hard-working WCW wrestlers stuck around because, quite simply, it paid the bills, and you can't really blame them for that either. WCW in late 1999 had all the tools to still make a great wrestling show, but creatively, they were already bankrupt, and because the World Wrestling Federation were so hot at the time, fans were more attracted to Vince McMahon's television shows in comparison to the sometimes confusing nonsense that WCW produced at the time. A group of guys within WCW got fed up with the creative direction the company had gone in, the politics that controlled the locker room and the match cards, and they also got fed up with their lack of real opportunities within the organisation, even though they were still getting paid quite handsomely. These four guys, consisting of Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn, Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko, would leave WCW and debut in the World Wrestling Federation together as a stable, and that stable was known as the Radicals, and the Radicals are the subject of today's video. Benoit, Saturn and Malenko were part of the Revolution faction in WCW, a group that also included the franchise Shane Douglas. While the Revolution were one of the more interesting things that WCW presented during mid-1999, the faction were also turned into a kinda anti-government group when Vince Russo took over creative, a move that, in my opinion, seriously hurt what the faction was supposed to be. It went from a quite realistic concept about guys who were being kept down to a standard wrestling storyline that was difficult to take seriously. Malenko, Benoit, Saturn, Eddie Guerrero, Shane Douglas and others all voiced their displeasure backstage about how things were going. They were fed up of the booking and the politics that ran rampant in World Championship Wrestling. And in early 2000, Perry Saturn picked up the phone to call Bruce Pritchard at the World Wrestling Federation to see if there was any chance that a few guys could jump over to the WWF. Pritchard said that this phone call took place the day after WCW sold out 2000, and at that pay-per-view, Chris Benoit won the WCW World Heavyweight title. This was reportedly a last-ditch effort to keep Benoit with World Championship Wrestling. Chris had been extremely vocal backstage about wanting to leave the company, and even though they had personal differences, it was Booker Kevin Sullivan who decided to put the World Heavyweight title on Chris Benoit. By this point though, winning the WCW title and working under the creative influence of guys like Kevin Nash and Kevin Sullivan, this all meant very little to Chris Benoit. There's been a lot of mixed reports in regards to how Shane Douglas fitted into all of this and it comes down to who you believe and what you want to believe really. Douglas apparently wanted out of WCW too and he was supposed to be part of these WWF negotiations. Pritchard said that Saturn, Malenko, Benoit and Guerrero didn't mention Douglas during their initial meetings and while all four men wanted to come into the World Wrestling Federation as a group, that group did not include the franchise Shane Douglas. He simply wasn't mentioned during the whole negotiation period. 
Bruce Pritchard said that Douglas was in contact with Jim Ross, but there was no interest in bringing Shane back to the World Wrestling Federation, and Shane says that his revolution buddies made moves behind his back to kinda keep him away, almost disowning the franchise and not including him in their future plans. Shane spoke about this time period and he pretty much says that his colleagues stabbed him in the back in order to go work for Vince McMahon. Shane said, We all went to the hotel, packed our bags, had dinner and we all swore we were going to stick together. My whole thing was I had worked with Vince on three different occasions. If there's any weakness at all, he'll find it and he'll capitalize on it. In other words, if we stick together, we stand to make a hell of a lot more money than if we stand apart. We all shook on it, we all hugged on it, we all drank a glass of wine on it and toasted to it. We said if anyone got a phone call that we would share the information from the phone call with each other. Throughout the whole week, I did that. As I got a call from Bruce Pritchard, I hung up and called the other guys and they did the same. You need to remember that the following information is all one guy's perspective and you need to take everything here with a pinch of salt. Shane said that Vince Russo called him to let him know that some of his friends were currently in a meeting in a Stamford hotel with WWF personnel. Shane phoned Dean Milenko and Dean said he was currently in Florida with his brother. Shane called Russo back and he told him what Dean just said. Russo was adamant that Shane's friends were currently negotiating their WWF deals behind Shane's back and so Shane called the hotel to see if his friends just checked in. The guy at the front desk confirmed it. Between his friends negotiating their contracts behind his back and with the WWF probably having little interest in the franchise anyway, it was clear that Dean would not be working for Vince McMahon again anytime soon. In regards to Dean Malenko, Shane said, When I first went to WCW, it was common knowledge we were friends and a lot of people in the dressing room came up to me and said, be careful of Dean because he has a lot of hate in the dressing room. I went to my wife and said, I don't see it, Dean isn't the kind of guy that would have hate. Now looking back, I can clearly see what everybody was talking about. Dean wrote me a letter one time after the incident had happened and it said something along the lines of how sorry he was with what happened, how bad he felt. We have been friends for the past 7 years and he didn't want to lose that friendship. I took the step and called him and we talked very briefly and I haven't heard from him since. It's also been reported that Billy Kidman, Juventud Guerrera and Conan were also guys who were unhappy with World Championship Wrestling and they too were trying everything they could to leave the company. And Bruce Pritchard said that Conan did indeed call the offices numerous times, but because he called himself K-Dog, Pritchard apparently had no idea who he was and he never called back. Howard Finkel knew who K-Dog was, he even told Pritchard that this was Conan trying to get in touch, but Pritchard never did call back to get the guy hired. Apparently Pritchard and Conan did speak on the phone, but because Bruce didn't know who it was, he told Conan to send in some tapes of his work and a few photographs to WWF headquarters. I think that one of the things that makes the Radicals so noteworthy is the fact that this was pretty much a mutiny where the guys involved actually followed up on their promises. Guerrero, Benoit and Malenko had been cornerstones of WCW since the beginning of the Nitro era and fans legitimately enjoyed seeing these guys work in WCW during a time when the NWO controlled the main events. Along with this, all three men had wrestled all around the world and they incorporated styles from different countries and regions. They had combined history in Japan, Mexico, Europe. They spent time in ECW working with and against each other. Truly, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero were masters of their craft and losing these guys was going to be a huge blow for WCW. 
Perry Saturn shouldn't be overlooked either. While he may not have had the same experience as his radical teammates, he did have a following thanks to his days in ECW as part of the Eliminators. Saturn also had a good feud with Raven in WCW when Saturn left the flock, resulting in two good pay-per-view matches at Bash at the Beach and Fall Brawl 98 respectively. The Radicals coming into the World Wrestling Federation though was a big deal and it doesn't seem to get the same recognition as other big defections during the Monday Night Wars. What you have to remember though is that these guys were only seen as mid-card talent because that's how WCW decided to portray them. In reality, they had more experience inside the ring than most of the WWF roster at the time and what's more, they could deliver in the ring, maybe even to a much higher standard than some WWF main eventers. So the question was, how would the WWF use these guys and how would they fit in? Chris Benoit would not be bringing the WCW heavyweight title with him to the World Wrestling Federation. Vince McMahon had no interest in bringing the title over for a few reasons, mainly because it was an unnecessary legal headache. Benoit also simply did not care for the WCW World Heavyweight title because he didn't care about WCW. In his opinion, he was the champion of nothing, so the belt was handed back and WCW came up with a story where Benoit's opponent opponent, Sid, had his foot under the ropes when Benoit won the title it sold out. So Chris wouldn't be making a grand entrance into the World Wrestling Federation, holding the WCW title on the entranceway while his three WCW buddies stood around him. And Chris wouldn't be claiming that he was the real world champion or anything like that. No, the Radicals made their debut by sitting in the audience watching WWF Raw. I mean, it isn't the worst way to debut, it sure did create a lot of intrigue and it kept fans waiting for the inevitable jump over the guardrail, but honestly I think a whole lot more could have been done with the debut of the Radicals. On the 31st of January 2000 episode of Raw is War, 15 days after Chris Benoit won the WCW Championship, the Radicals showed up at the beginning of the broadcast. The New Age Outlaws had a tag team match with Al Snow and Steve Blackman and Snow took the time to shake hands and hug these former WCW and ECW superstars before the match begun. During the bout, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler said that these four guys had walked away from their last employer and they had been negotiating with the World Wrestling Federation, but they still didn't sign any contracts. To his credit, Jim Ross put all four guys over and he didn't pay much attention to the match itself and really, fans watching at home couldn't have cared less about what was going on in the ring either. The Road Dog found himself getting dumped over the guardrail, the Radicals looked like they were going to leave him alone but a cheap shot to Chris Benoit led to Jesse James getting an absolute beating. The Radicals got in the ring, we saw an Eddie Guerrero frog splash and we saw Chris Benoit's diving head but the audience went crazy. The Radicals left the ring and headed back up the entranceway. Jerry Lawler said these guys aren't hired and they shouldn't be heading into the locker room but that's exactly where they were headed. The Outlaws complained to Triple H and Stephanie McMahon about the Radicals. Hunter says that the Radicals were apparently invited to Raw by Mick Foley and Hunter can't understand why the Outlaws just wouldn't go out and beat all four men up. While all this was going on, the Radicals had a meeting with the Main Street Posse that led to Pete Gass, Rodney and Joey Abs getting absolutely destroyed. A little later on, we saw Foley introduce the Radicals to the rest of the WWF locker room and everyone was very welcoming, no problems at all. It looked like the WWF boys were happy to have these four WCW guys in their locker room. Well, at least in storyline. Foley then introduced Benoit, Guerrero, Malenko and Saturn to Triple H and Foley told Hunter and Stephanie that these four guys want to work for the World Wrestling Federation. Triple H asked why would he hire these guys and Foley said because people might be a little tired of seeing the Main Street Posse on Raw's War every week. Stephanie says that these four guys have problems with management and they may not be very trustworthy, but Chris Benoit says all they want is an opportunity. 
Triple H says he'll think about it. Before Hunter's main event match with Kane, the game told the Radicals that they weren't ready to hang in the World Wrestling Federation and he ordered all four men and Cactus Jack to get out of the arena. When Hunter went to the ring for his match with Kane, the Big Red Machine didn't show up. Instead, Cactus Jack reappeared and a fight broke out between the two men. Hunter tried to leave the ring but the Radicals showed up. Benoit, Malenko, Saturn and Guerrero helped McFoley in beating up the game a little more and then Raw went off the air. So you want to see some guys getting buried? Look no further than the following episode of Smackdown where the Radicals had their first respective matches in the World Wrestling Federation. Cactus Jack and the Radicals opened up the show and Foley said that the Radicals are once again his guests tonight. Foley sends a message to Triple H saying that these four men left the ring on Monday Night Raw when they could have done a lot more damage. The Radicals aren't after Triple H's blood, they're after contracts. Foley says that Triple H needs to understand where these guys came from. In Atlanta, Georgia, the mentality is to do what you're told and collect a fat paycheck, but that's not the mentality that the Radicals had while working in WCW. Wrestling is more important than money to these guys, and they want to work with the very best wrestlers in the world, and the very best wrestlers in the world are right here in the World Wrestling Federation. Mick says that Triple H should respect the Radicals for coming in and going straight after the game himself and when Mick threatens to hold up Smackdown until the Radicals get their contracts, Triple H and D-Generation X come out. Hunter says if he feels like it, he could walk down the ramp and destroy every man stood in the ring. These Radicals are trespassing and they don't belong in the World Wrestling Federation. With that being said, Hunter says that he and DX are not afraid of competition, D-Generation X thrives on competition, and so maybe the Radicals would have a chance here. Stephanie McMahon grabs the microphone. She says the Radicals may have been hotshots in WCW, but after reviewing their matches, Stephanie says that all four men are average in the ring. This makes Eddie Guerrero laugh while keeping his eyes locked on the road dog, I'm sure. And then Triple H announces that the Radicals are going to have their chance tonight on SmackDown, a sort of tryout series for these newcomers. Hunter then makes a few matches, X-Pac vs Dean Malenko, The Outlaws vs Guerrero and Saturn, and as for Chris Benoit, well Triple H says that the last time he saw Benoit, he was standing in a WCW ring holding a shiny belt. Benoit had become the standard bearer for WCW, well tonight Benoit goes up against the WWF standard bearer, the game Triple H. Hunter then announces that the Radicals will get their contracts if they win 2 out of 3 matches. Malenko vs X-Pac was the first match and the Radicals watched from the locker room. The match got a mixed reaction from the audience and Dean Malenko ended up losing after taking a low blow followed by the axe factor. Triple H laughed backstage, if Guerrero and Saturn couldn't beat the Outlaws then the Benoit match didn't even need to happen, seeing as the Radicals wouldn't be getting WWF contracts anyway. This tag match was better received in comparison to the Dean Malenko match, but tragedy struck towards the end of the bout. Eddie Guerrero legitimately dislocated his elbow after hitting a frog splash. Saturn and Guerrero were apparently supposed to win this match, but Guerrero panicked and he told the Road Dog to pin him, meaning that the Radicals lost another match. Granted, this kinda means the plan wasn't to completely bury these four guys on their first night of in-ring competition, but still, things really weren't looking too good for the Radicals. Because of Guerrero's injury, the match couldn't be reshot or retaped in order to fix the finish. And remember, Benoit vs Triple H was still supposed to main event the show, but now there was no reason for the match to take place. The Radicals had lost their kayfabe tryout matches. 
To explain this away, Triple H said backstage that he's feeling generous and he wants to show Chris Benoit that not a single one of these WCW guys can cut the mustard in the World Wrestling Federation. So Triple H vs Benoit was still going to take place thanks to the kindness in Triple H's heart. So what we have here technically is a WCW champion versus WWF champion match when you consider that Benoit didn't really get beaten for the belt. And yes, I know it's a stretch too, but that's sure what Triple H tried to imply at the start of the show, so I'll go with it. Michael Cole said on commentary that this will be Benoit's first and last WWF match, seeing as the Radicals had failed in their previous tryout matches, so Chris Benoit had nothing to lose during this bout. Benoit showed absolutely no fear when squaring up to the game. Triple H gets the early advantage, but Benoit comes right back. Cole said that Benoit is like a wounded dog when considering how tragic this night has been for the Radicals. Triple H again overpowers Benoit in the corner and the two men push each other around. And then Benoit is able to floor the game before going for the crossface. Triple H gets out of the ring and at least Hunter was making Chris look like a threat here. The game looks shocked as Benoit invites Hunter to get back inside the ring for more punishment. Triple H takes time to regain his composure on the outside and when the match resumes, Hunter takes control for a brief moment before Benoit fires back with some knife edge chops. Benoit hits a snap suplex before the match spills to the outside. Benoit keeps control until Triple H begins using the steel steps to his advantage. The game lays in some kicks in the corner and although Benoit tries to fight back, he ends up taking a running knee. Benoit just won't stop fighting though, a side suplex gets followed up with three German suplexes and it looks like it's game over for Triple H. Benoit goes upstairs for the diving headbutt and Triple H pushes the referee into the ropes. This results in Triple H hitting a superplex but Benoit kicks out a two. Hunter then goes for the pedigree but Benoit reverses it, slingshotting Hunter into the referee. The crossface then gets locked in and Triple H tops out but there's no referee. The audience are very much into the match as Benoit locks in a second crossface but the referee wakes up and he notices Triple H's hand is on the ropes. Benoit takes a face buster but he replies straight away with a clothesline. And then Chris Benoit goes upstairs one more time hoping to put the match away with his signature diving headbutt. Benoit nails it and Triple H still kicks out. The match then ends when Hunter hits a low blow followed by the pedigree. It's a clean sweep for D-Generation X and the Radicals lose each of their respective WWF debut matches. X-Pac was scheduled to kick off the following episode of Raw but he was interrupted by the Radicals. Perry Saturn said the Radicals tried to make an impact and they tried to gain contracts. And Dean Malenko continues by saying that the four of them had a golden opportunity on Smackdown but the Radicals were simply not good enough. Eddie Guerrero gets a great ovation when he thanks the fans for giving their support and Benoit then asks for Cactus Jack to come out so they could say thank you before leaving for good. Mick Foley comes out to say goodbye to the Radicals and then Triple H shows up to set up the Cactus Jack vs Triple H No Way Out Hell in a Cell match. And then it's revealed that Triple H actually gave the Radicals their WWF contracts and to show their appreciation Benoit Malenko Saturn and an injured Guerrero give Cactus Jack a beating. The Radicals turned heel after just one week and after getting soundly defeated on Smackdown match after match. What's more, they had aligned themselves with the same guy who orchestrated their destruction. It was truly a baffling booking decision, but it shouldn't surprise us either. There was no way these four were coming in as baby faces and cleaning house. Now though, as heels, they could win matches using underhanded tactics. Malenko, Saturn and Benoit main evented Raw when they teamed up with Triple H and X-Pac to take on Cactus Jack, The Rock, Rikishi and Too Cool. And of course, Chris Benoit scored the win for his team. 
That's going to do it for this video, as really, the Radicals' time together would be so short that it's best covering their individual journeys rather than their collective one. Plus, I've already gone over some of this stuff in previous videos. Being a fan of all four members of the Radicals during their WCW days, I was extremely happy when the four men made the jump from WCW to the WWF in 2000, but that excitement was quickly washed away due to the Smackdown booking on the 3rd of February and also due to Eddie's pretty heartbreaking injury. But still, on an individual level, all four men would overcome their losses and of course, a few members of the Radicals went on to become main eventers in the World Wrestling Federation. Again, this is all for future videos on the channel. The debut of the Radicals is still very interesting though, how these guys banded together to leave one wrestling organisation to join another was very noteworthy, and seeing four WCW guys just show up on WWF programming was also very exciting. It's a story from the later days of the Monday Night War that doesn't get covered enough because of, well, because of Chris Benoit, quite honestly. Hopefully you enjoyed this video though, thank you very very much for watching and take care.